Josh, I just squeezed this milk out of a cow. Can you turn it into ice cream? Has it even been processed yet? What does that mean? Well, it has to be tested, separated, pasteurized, standardized, homogenized before it can even become ice cream. Oh, well, can you do that for me? Unfortunately, no. If only we had a place like that at U and L. There is a need for a small-scale milk processing plant at the University of Nebraska that will process, package, and market raw milk from a small university dairy. That sounds like a lot of equipment. This facility must be huge. Actually, the proposed facility will only take up 3,000 square feet and be complete with a large cooler and a lab for testing and controls. Excess milk and cream will be sent to the dairy plant for ice cream production on campus. Hear that, Alicia? Soon you'll be able to watch how every step of your ice cream is made here at UNL. I can't wait! Farm Fresh Milk, coming soon to UNL. Hi everyone, my name is Rosie. And I am really sad because I love eating organic grasses, but lately I haven't been able to eat any in the southeast corner of the farm because the contaminated runoff from the neighboring farm has made my food really spicy and I just don't like it. <laughs> Luckily, my farmer hired a group of intelligent biological systems engineers from UNL to find a solution to make my food meet the organic standard. There is a need to design a system that eliminates the impact of contaminated runoff in the southeast corner of the Green Place Incorporated. Our solution is the dry detention basin that will capture runoff from the neighboring farm and surrounding area for small storm events. The pond will contain native prairie grasses because they have long root structures that can handle water flow, prevent erosion, and they have been found to be able to remove contaminants like herbicides and insecticides from runoff that infiltrates the soil. We have designed a dry detention basin and riser structure that will capture the runoff from the neighboring farm and hold it for a specific amount of time required to be filtered by the native grass. Once filtered and free of contaminants, the water will be slowly released and the pond will dry up. Well, isn't that just moving? Now I can eat all of the organic grasses that I desire. We gonna celebrate your party with you. Come on now. Hi, this is Becca, Abby, Riker, and Chandler, presenting our Cripple Creek Stream Restoration Senior Design Project. Over the past 30 years, Lincoln has developed rapidly, especially south of Pine Lake Road. This development and increase of impervious area have decreased water infiltration and increased runoff into Cripple Creek, creating erosion issues downstream. Storm events in which water levels are at or exceeding the banks are becoming more common with the added development and our changing climate. Events like these are especially likely to cause significant erosion due to high water velocity. Over time, the stream has been greatly degraded from these storm events, and the Homeowners Association land is being cut into by the eroded stream. Areas of the stream are becoming increasingly dangerous due to the steep banks and the concrete liner being cut underneath by the large volume of water. When there is no storm occurring, the stream smoothly follows the concrete liner, causing no erosion or any safety hazards. It is important to maintain a steady base flow in any design to prevent standing water and maintain the aesthetics of the common space. There is a need for a solution to restore and stabilize the eroded stream banks, fix drainage issues during log drain events, and mitigate risks of flooding in the Cripple Creek HOA's common space. Dredging the pre-existing detention pond south of Pine Lake Road will reduce the volume of water traveling downstream during storm events and will store about 2.4 acre feet of water during the storm, after which the outlet pipe will slowly release the water until the pond is dry and is ready for the next event. Widening the stream and planting native grasses on the side slopes will increase the capacity of the stream, reduce the overall channel velocity, and stabilize the stream banks from additional erosion. Suddenly mowing the native grasses will increase the bank stability, reducing the possibility of erosion. A series of gabion rock weirs will hold back water during large storm events and allow the base flow to travel underneath through the porous structure when no storm is occurring. Holding back water will slow the velocity and prevent severe erosion downstream. The outlet of the weir will act as a hydraulic jump, dissipating much of the water's energy. This combination of implemented solutions will restore and stabilize the stream, as well as prevent erosion in the future. Howdy folks, this is Team 4 with Josh, Dayton, Sam, and Jacob, and this project is the Cripple Creek Stream Restoration. This area is located in South Lincoln and was built in the 1990s. 
The area is located inside the red circle. As you can see, the pre-development and post-development are a little bit different. The increased urbanization has led to increased water volume and in water velocity downstream. Those increases in discharge and velocity cause the erosion. The increase in discharge causes there to be a greater velocity, and the velocity hits the stream bank, dislodging the soil particles present. To counteract these high velocities, we're going to build a retention basin at the headwaters of this creek. It will have a controlled outlet structure that will be designed for different storm events and let different water velocities out. And to explain the final part of our project, we wrote a wrap. We called it the Rip Wrap Wrap. Name is Jacob, come to bring the juice. You need stream cover or else your sediment will come loose. Straightened channels got me in denial. Rip Wrap, come to save the day in a pile. Hold down the shore, break up velocity. Come to our stream so that you can see. Gotta be careful how much Rip Wrap you use, else your wallet will be filled with bad news. Vegetation is the life of the cheap. Protect your stream from flow peak. Loose them, switch grass, water will pass. Cover your stream or erosion will take you to class. That's all, folks. The high pressure pasteurization process, also called HPP, uses high pressure to kill bacteria while maintaining a low temperature that prevents cooking of food products. Pre cooking certain foods can decrease their nutritional value, so HPP, a form of cold pasteurization, can help to ensure that products with high water content, like bottled beverages, fruits, vegetables, and meats, are pasteurized without compromising the flavor or nutritional content of the food. Barrels are loaded with pre-packaged drinks or food with high water content. These barrels are placed in a chamber which is sealed and then slowly pumped full of water. Water is pumped continuously into the chamber up until 600 megapascals of pressure, then held there for several minutes to ensure that the pressure bursts all potential pathogens. 600 megapascals is more pressure than is found at the deepest parts of the ocean. Due to this high pressure, some increase in temperature is expected. Our client, Instinct, a raw pet food company, wants to monitor the temperature of their meat chubs during HPP to ensure that the food is not cooked. Thus, we set out to design our casing, temperature sensor, and data logger combination, which can survive the HPP process. The design that we chose has a central cylinder that overlaps with two plugs. These plugs are attached to each other using threaded rods. The overlap between the end caps ensures that when the high pressure is applied to the casing, then the cylinder tightens around the plug at the overlap. Thus, the water pressure helps to maintain the seal. O-rings are also used to ensure the casing is watertight. A printed circuit board is used to organize all of the electronics. The casing should be flush with the material of interest in order to monitor the temperature of that material. With our product, we can monitor the HPP process and help ensure that your food is safer and healthier than ever. Do you love your dog? Are you super rich? Yeah, thought so. But what do you do when your happy, healthy dog becomes injured? Cranial cruciate ligament, CCL, tears, and medial patellar luxation, or MPL, are two of the most common injuries in dogs. These cost a whopping two to four thousand dollars to repair. Do you really want to add to that for MRI and CT scans? No, you're poor. Instead, your vet will diagnose your dog by hand. Vet students are often trained on cadaver legs. Gross, stinky, nasty, hard to source. We have a solution for you, a synthetic hind leg that mimics your dog's injury. Look at dog leg model S1000. This fine specimen can demonstrate the CCL tear injury. The model was created using state-of-the-art 3D scanning and printing technology for the best user performance. Look at how the model demonstrates CCL injury. Future models will demonstrate healthy knee movements and medial patellar luxation to further instruct vet students. Thank you. See you later. Stay tuned for our presentation next week, y'all. Man, I wish I could collect fluid and solid samples from the duodenum of this cow to see the ruminant nutrition from them eating the pasture. There is a way. Have you ever heard of a duodenal cannula? No, I haven't.
These are two current designs used as duodenal cannulas. The one on the left can be used to collect solid samples, and the one on the right can be used to collect liquid samples. Oh man, but wouldn't it be nice if we just had one that could collect both fluids and solids? This is our combined design that has uh, semicircular ends and also that full tube down at the bottom to hopefully allow the researchers to collect both liquid and solid samples using one single device. This device is implanted in calves when they're young and allows researchers to collect fluid and solid samples to study ruminant nutrition as the cows grow up. Holy cow! <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Adam Deutsch and I'm here on behalf of Team 8 and we are the Assisted Elliptical Project. So our project was given to us by two doctors at UNMC and our main task was to go ahead and try and restore some motor function in a patient who had um, a TBI when he was younger. And so with that, we were trying to get an elliptical that could maybe help him relearn that walking motion, kind of like what you have on the, on the elliptical already. So here's our design, we'll show you what we got working on. In front of me, I have the elliptical to kind of give you guys some background here. Our patient is going to be on this side, strapped into a harness so he has some support while he's walking. And this little 3D printed wheel gear down here is going to articulate with a pedal system that goes right here. And so with that belt that we have attached to it, the trainer would sit in a chair that can use whatever chair they want. And there'll be a pedal system down here. And so while they pedal the pedals that are attached to the band here and attached to the 3D printed wheel, it's actually going to move the elliptical along to give the, the patient some more, um, some more oomph when they're pedaling and stuff. And so as the patient gets stronger and stronger, the trainer can use less and less of their pedaling and thus the patient will end up gaining function back in their legs. So to sum it all up, we had a patient who had a TBI and there's a need for rehabilitation so he can walk again. Um, what have we done? We've modified the normal elliptical and we're gonna add an element so the trainer can assist, like I said, similar to a bike pedal. Then what is the future plan? Ideally, we'd like to add a center support column so that patient has some more structure uh, when they're sitting in the machine. And the final goal would be to sell this to rehab centers and at-home users so they have a cheaper alternative than using those motorized machines, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars. After this clip, I'll attach a picture of the CAD rendering so you guys have an example of what it's gonna look like. But other than that, thanks for watching. Abdominal fascia dehiscence is a major postoperative complication that occurs in up to 10% of patients following abdominal surgery. Dehiscence is the opening of a wound that has been surgically sutured and commonly occurs due to the failure of the stitches holding the fascia together. The fascia is a layer of connective tissue, and after surgery, this layer retracts more than the surrounding tissue layers, making the fascia more susceptible to tearing and the wound more difficult to close. We were tasked with creating a device that connects to the fascia layer and prevents retraction of the fascia edges. Our device is intended to be attached to the fascia by puncturing through the tissue to distribute the tension force following surgery and tightened over the course of one week to bring the fascia edges within four centimeters of one another. This allows a surgeon to remove the device and successfully suture the wound together. Several of the devices may be used to cover the span of the wound. This in turn decreases the likelihood to hissence occurs as the tension being placed on the final sutures holding the edges together is less. <coughs> I have some good news. We get to go home! Hello, my name is Sarah Loftus. I'm Kennedy Young. And I'm Aspen Schoenrock. And we are part of Design Team 10. Our project is surgical magnification. This deals with orthopedic surgeons in the OR who are having neck and back pain. This is due to their long hours with bad posture over a body cavity. Our design is to eliminate that neck and back pain by bringing up the field of surgery, as well as magnifying the field times two. After meeting with a surgeon and the Nebraska Medicine design team, we've decided to digitize our design. Uh, we are now using cameras and monitors rather than using lenses and optics. 
Our design we've decided to go with is a harness with a camera attached. It will be above the sterile line so that we do not have to worry about the sterilization of this product. The camera will allow the visual field to be brought up to a monitor and the surgeon will no longer have to bend over to see the body cavity. Hey, how are your crops doing? Not great. I can't figure out how much water they need. Well, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to scan over the field to know exactly which crops need more water so you could get a better yield? I don't know. That seems really hard to manage. Well, well wait, what's that? Whoa. We're group 11 and our project was to design the camera for a model spider cam that will be used to teach children about engineering and agriculture. This is what the model of the spider cam actually looks like. The Legos make it hands-on and interactive while being easily approachable and understandable for people without any prior knowledge of the spider cam. Our camera can show which plants are dead or alive as shown in this picture. There's also a text output which tells the density of the plants and their percentage in each space shown in the picture below. These codes could be expanded and used in other scenarios as well as in many other developing industries such as the biomedical industry. All right, so several years ago, this was the transmission used by the quarter scale tractor team. Uh, it's a transaxle from a Kawasaki mule. Uh, while this transmission was fairly reliable, uh, one of the big issues is that the input shaft was parallel to the axle. So it made it rather difficult to, uh, to design around um, and it was just never really quite ideal for our application. Um, upon going away from the Kawasaki transmission, quarter scale transferred over to a super transmission in 2018 is an adaption off of an old Cub Cadet transmission and it was based off a uh, really simple design and was just straight gear tooth meshing for, a shift, for its way of shifting. Unfortunately though it proved to be rather unreliable when we were putting the amounts of torque through it so we had to do modifications to make it more reliable and only allowed it to have a forward and a reverse. This, our senior design project, is the Cube. This is a high-low it's a transmission with a high low and a forward reverse, similar to the Kawasaki, and uses the same rotating shift arms for easy shifting. However, it is in a much nicer package with the input perpendicular to the way the axles would sit in the tractor. 